Fora TV. The world is thinking. This book has a lot of very short chapters, and this is from chapter 42, which is called Going Away. Sistema avoids pursuit whenever possible, the uncles taught. Sistema prefers not to flee, rather, it goes away. The distinction was difficult to express, but easily demonstrated through something as simple as the attempted grappling of wrists across a table. The wrist trained in Sistema went away. But Tito, <clears throat> having been directed to a particular place, the mysteriously named Hotel W, could no longer fully practice going away, the art of which is dependent on a genuine lack of direction. To be pursued, as Oshosi assured him he now was, was to accept a certain disadvantage. But there was Sistema for this as well, and he chose to demonstrate it now, taking the back of a bench at speed, dropping, rolling, coming up with his momentum intact, but headed in the direction opposite. A simple enough business, spending momentum in the roll, but he heard a child cheer to see it. The nearest of his three pursuers was just rounding the bench as Tito vaulted back over it past him and hit the path, running east now. <clears throat> he looked back. The other two, untrained slaves to their own momentum, were carried past the first and very nearly ran into the bench. These were the ones he'd seen Marcos trip. One of them had a bloodied mouth. With Oshosi at his shoulder, Tito ran toward Union Square East and 17th Street. The Orisha wanted him out of the park and its calculable geometries of pursuit. A cab slid in front of him as he reached the traffic on Union Square East. He went over its hood, meeting the eyes of its driver as he slid past the windshield, friction burning his thigh through his jeans. The driver slammed his horn and held it, <clears throat> and other horns woke reflexively. A sudden uneven blaring that mounted to crescendo as his three pursuers reached the stream of traffic. Tito looked back and saw the one with the bloody mouth maneuvering between crowded bumpers, holding something aloft like a token, a badge, Tito guessed. Tito ran north, bent low, deliberately slowing, weaving through the crowd, some of whom were pausing to see what the horns were about. Faces peered from the windows of a restaurant. He looked back and saw the bloody-mouthed man spill a woman out of his way as he ran after Tito. Tito sped up, Oshosi noting that his pursuer was still gaining. He ran across 17th without slowing, saw the entrance to the restaurant, a revolving door. He ran on to the hotel's en entrance, an airy lip of glass protruding to shelter it. Under the startled doorman's black-shirted arm, past a woman just emerging, he saw Brother Man descending two broad marble steps, divided by a central railing. Brother Man wore a Federal Express uniform and cradled a flat red, white, and blue carton upright in his arms. He had never seen Brother Man in shorts before. As Tito threw right his new shoes grabbing the white marble, he heard the bloody-mouthed man slam through the doors behind him. He glimpsed a sinuous overhang of stairway deeper in the lobby and registered the distinctive sound of Brother Man releasing on his exit 30 pounds of 12-millimeter steel ball bearings through the trick bottom of his FedEx carton and onto the white marble. Tito sprinted south. Ososhi indicating that his pursuer, who must have missed the bearings, was only a few steps behind. Into the restaurant, 
darting past the row of tables by the south-facing windows, past the unbelieving faces of diners who an instant before had been lingering over desserts and coffees. The man with the bloody mouth caught his left shoulder and he careered into a table, food and glassware flying, a woman screaming. In the instant of contact, Ilegua, mounting Tito with nauseating speed, had reached back with Tito's right hand, slipped something from the man's belt, and now simultaneously drew and fired the Bulgarian's pneumatic gun with his left from under Tito's right armpit. An inhuman shriek unmounted the Orisha as Tito saw the illuminated exit sign and slammed through the door beneath it, past the laden carts of busboys. Kitchen staff in white flung themselves out of his way. He slipped in something wet, nearly went down, ran on. <clears throat> exit sign, slamming out into sudden sunlight as an alarm triggered behind him. A large green van, neatly lettered in silver, one of its twin rear doors open. Prada man, no longer wearing his painter's overalls, reaching down his hand. Tito handed him the leather-cased badge Allegua had taken from the pursuer's belt. The man flipped it open. Ice, he said, and pocketed it. He boosted Tito into the truck, a dark, hollow, diesel-smelling space with odd, dim light. You've already met, Prada man said. He jumped out of the truck and slammed and locked the door. <clears throat> Be seated, said the old man from a bench fastened lengthwise across the space with canvas strapping. We wouldn't want you injured in case of a sudden stop. Tito climbed over the back of the padded bench, discovering the two ends of a simple seat belt. He fastened them as the driver put the truck in gear heading west, then swung north onto Park. I trust they took it from you, the old man asked in Russian. Yes, they did, Tito replied in English. Very good, said the old man in Russian. Very good. Thank you.